Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining THCA webinar, OSHA's Record Keeping Rules and What You Need to Know. I'm Wendy Johnson with the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. PHCA offers monthly webinars to members to receive updates from department staff on regulations, learn from industry experts on current trends and practices, and to gain a better understanding of practical application tools to equip you so that you may continue to provide the highest level of quality care possible. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the PHCA website. The webinar has been approved for 1.5 continuing education credits for PHCA members. Credits will be uploaded to NAB within the next two months those who have provided us with your unique NAB number. I'll be sending a link to a quick survey for your feed, your feedback is important to us and uh, it's important to our speaker as well, so please take a moment to complete the survey. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. However, throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit questions using your questions pane on the right hand of your screen and our presenter will address them at the end of the presentation. Now for today's webinar. Today's webinar will be presented by Dale Blacken, Compliance Assistance Specialist for OSHA's Harrisburg Area Office. Dale will review a number of record-keeping requirements that you should be aware of. Your learning objectives for today's webinar are briefly reviewing OSHA's record-keeping forms and resources, reviewing what and how to report severe injuries and illnesses to OSHA, knowing when and how to electronically submit your injury and illness data, learning about acceptable incentive drug testing and disincentive programs, determining if you are responsible for reporting your temporary workers, and lastly, find out where you can go for help. I'll now turn the webinar over to Dale. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate everybody's interest in this, and uh, we're going to hit a lot of topics today. Uh, but we're not going to hit everything in excruciating detail, but we're going to make sure that you have enough information that will help you in a number of different ways. Um, I put this together uh, for a wide range of audiences, folks that maybe, maybe they do a lot of uh, HR work but haven't touched the safety side much. Also, for those who have been doing it for a while, so it's going to have basic information. Plus, we're going to dig into some of the uh, some of the few of the nuances, as well as some of the new regulatory changes that I've been seeing where people have been getting in trouble. So it's going to be a little bit of a mix of everything to help everybody. To start, I want to actually hit some statistics. Then we're going to hit the record keeping information, which starts with the recording, the electronic reporting, and then also the uh, reporting aspects of record keeping. We're going to look at uh, the incentive programs, talk about the temporary workers, and then what help the government has out there to help you with your programs. And I'm a big uh, believer in empowering people, so I'll be showing you some resources, places you can go for help. And then, of course, if you still get stuck, you can give us a call. So I'm trying to. Um, trying to help you there. To start off, I just want to review a little bit about OSHA and where we fit into the main scheme of things. Um, our head of the Department of Labor, which is what OSHA comes under, is Mr. Acosta. And as you can see by looking at the very bottom, near the uh, bottom left, you'll see OSHA and beside it MSHA. Uh, disability Acts, uh, to the right of that Bureau of Labor Statistics. So this gives you a feel for the layout for uh, the Department of Labor as a whole. And then drilling down, since the, the cabinet member is the Secretary of Labor, Mr. Acosta, we, we then go to OSHA, which is the referred to as the Assistant Secretary, because OSHA is actually under the Department of Labor. And here we have our uh, current head. She's the deputy. Uh, she's also the acting head of OSHA. That's Lauren Sweat. And what we have is the two main sides of OSHA. On the right side, we see the different regions. That would be your enforcement side, enforcement programs, training, uh, construction. And when we get on the left side, we actually have the standards where they come from, emergency management, uh, whistleblower provisions. 
as well as cooperative and state programs. So that's how OSHA is laid out. And while we're talking about um, our Deputy Assistant Secretary, she comes to us from the House, has many years of experience working with OSHA and MSHA, so she uh, comes to us with a lot of experience in this role. Uh, a little bit about where we're at at the moment. Um, our fatalities over the years have been coming down. This is very good news, and if anybody says, does the safety thing really work? My answer to them is most certainly. It definitely does. We had around 14,000 fatalities, and it's come down to less than 6,000, while in the years that OSHA has been in existence, the number of workplaces have more than doubled, the workforce has more than doubled, and the numbers continue have continued to go down until we look at some of the more recent years. Um, 2009 was our low point, and then 2012 was actually a, um, I'm sorry, 2013 was our second low point, but we've actually been seeing the numbers slowly creeping up, which is a big concern to us. And I've had folks say, well, that's just numbers. Maybe more people are working. So what this next chart actually shows us is the rate per 100,000 workers, and it is definitely going up. And, this, and the reason I wanted to go over this was to show you why we need everybody's help, because if we're having more fatalities, we're having more of other types of injuries as well. And I know if we can all continue to work together as a team, we can keep driving these numbers down, um, both injuries and illnesses and fatalities. Where are we seeing our incidents? A lot of um, roadway, traffic-related, they're almost half, not quite. But uh, the real surprise to me is homicides, which was down around number three, number four, has now moved up to number two. And um, this can be anybody from a disgruntled worker to a problem at home that actually comes to work, um, maybe a spouse or whatever. Maybe you have people working with money, handling drugs, whatever the case may be. Uh, that's where we're seeing these homicides come from. And unfortunately, as we can see, they're number two, which is bad, followed by slip strips and falls, contact with objects, and exposure to um, harmful substances and environments. And I just wanted to hit falls while we're here. Uh, falls aren't going away. And actually, actually since 2009, we've had uh, 35 more of those per year. So if you have any situations where people are working from elevations, uh, maybe it's somebody going up on the roof once once a month to check a filter or whatever. Uh, we ask that you take a look at what they're doing, come up with a plan to protect them, because that's where we're actually seeing our fatalities come from, falls. Um, that's number three on our hit parade. But as we can see, as this number grows, it, it, um, it, it's pretty much neck to neck with um, with violence in the workplace. We're trying to get ahead of this one as well. And if we get people in the mode where they're planning out their activities, where they have a fall hazard, uh, we're providing the, the equipment, whether it be a ladder or a harness or whatever, and we're giving them the training to know that our expectations, hopefully we'll be able to get ahead of these. So we're trying to get there. And a chart that I didn't throw up on the uh, screen was how is Pennsylvania doing? Pennsylvania, actually, our numbers have been going down uh, despite the rest of the nation, uh, and I believe the reason that is, is uh, occurring is we actually have several universities in Pennsylvania, that, which safety schools, which many of the other states do not have. We have a very committed labor and industry group within the uh, Commonwealth here, and that group actually will give you 5% back on your workers' discount, uh, workers' compensation, which uh, that can be quite sizable sometimes for some companies. If you have worker safety committees comprised of management, the employees, you're doing worksite analysis, you're looking for, for hazards, you're correcting them. And so you're getting basically a reward for having a good safety program. Plus, we have uh, many safety professionals, many people like yourselves that are interested in safety, trying to do the right things. And Pennsylvania is um, one of the states with compliance assistance specialists like myself, which go out and do a number of presentations to help explain the rules, to help people get it right so they don't get in trouble. So we have a lot of things here in the Commonwealth that, that are helping lower our numbers. And uh, anything you can do will be part of that process. What I want to jump into next is our record keeping portion of our presentation. And we're going to go through some of the basics. 
But then as we go through this, we're going to keep peeling that onion back, going for more uh, depth, trying to get uh, more information to you to show you where we're at. So let's just start out. Let's talk about record keeping. Uh, basically, uh, most um, of the 8.2 million employers uh, aren't required to keep records because they've been exempt for one reason or another. However, about 1.4 million do have to keep records. So let's look at who's exempt. Small employers, that's the company as a whole, with 10 or less employees at all times through the year. So that doesn't mean that uh, part of the year they bump up to 15 or whatever. No, at all times they would be exempt. Also, those who are on our list, this Appendix A to Subpart B, and we have a complete list of, of NAICS codes, North American Industrial Classification codes, that would also be exempt. Now, for yourselves, your NAICS codes would be the 623312, 623311, and 623110. Uh, you are not exempt. Um, and what I will say, too, about those who were exempt Sometimes another federal agency or even OSHA will want to do a spot check to see how they're doing, so they would not be exempt. Um, they would have to submit those records. So just to give you a feel for what we're talking about for the company as a whole, uh, we get over here and we say, well, what is company? What is an establishment? You can have a main company. Uh, they have their own NAICS code, their own EIN number, but they have a lot of establishments underneath. So you might have one one main group with many, many branch offices maybe located throughout the state. They would each be considered establishments if they're all under one company. So when we're looking at that exemption for the 10 or less, um, that's the company as a whole. And, and it's important to have a good handle on that term, firm, company versus establishment, because later on, when we talk about other record keeping items, we're going to then talk about establishment. So you have to have a good feel for the difference between those two. And then um, here would be the uh, list, the partially exempt list, Appendix A to, to um, Subpart B. And if you need that whole list, we can look at it, but uh, your numbers are definitely included. Okay, so now let's jump into a little bit more of the record keeping. We're going to start with the forms. So this is for folks with more than 10 employees in certain industries. And what type of forms are we looking at? Well, our first report of injury, which would be a 301 injury and illness report form, our 300 log, which all of the, inform the uh, information from the 301 actually moves over there. It's populated on your, your OSHA log. And then at the end of the year, you take and summarize that into the summary form, and that's your 300A. So that's the main forms we're looking at. I've had questions from folks, well, how long do I need to keep these forms? Well, you've got to keep them for five years. That's the retention period for all three forms. And here's the form numbers again. So let's take a look at the different forms. And do you have to actually use this injury and illness report form? And the answer is no. You can automate this. You can put it on a computer. If your workers' comp form has the same Information can't have less, but at least this much information, which is on this form, you can use that in lieu of this. Uh, as I said, it can be computerized, um, so you don't have to actually use this form if you have another form that would take its place. Likewise, with the log, if you could do this on your computer, on a spreadsheet, or some specialized program, that's fine as well, as long as you're able to get the information on both the first report of injury form and the log within seven calendar days. You have to get it in there. We want to make sure it's not forgotten. I've had people come back and say, well, we're not sure if this is work-related. Maybe we should hold off on putting this on the log. Don't hold off. Uh, you have seven days, calendar days, to get it on there. If you find later on that it needed to come off or you needed to make some changes, you can put a line through it, initial it, um, and um, it's, it's it's um, taken off the log. And I'm sure any case that you have, I uh, know whenever I had my safety program, every case got its own folder, even property damage and everything else. Just in case something occurred later on, we would want to have a good file, a good record as to what occurred, and we would keep track of that. But um, So if you need to remove one, you can do that line through it. Of course, you initial it. Um, 
They also can be managed at your headquarters location as long as the information gets on, in there on a timely period. And if somebody needs the information at the establishment or an employee requests the information, you can get that to them within the seven calendar days. Now, if OSHA comes by and they would need to look at this information, you have to provide it to them within four business hours. So we would have to have that information accessible. So if it's at the headquarters, it has to be accessible. What else do we have here? Uh, here's the summary form. And basically, to help you out, if you notice when we go back and we look at the 300 log, at the top of the gray columns, you'll see GHIJ, KL, and that is the column number. And when you would go to do your summary report, you would add the numbers up at the bottom of each column, and you would actually put it in the corresponding number over here. Once again, the GHIJK, and you'd move the data over to here. Um, and then, of course, it's uh, certified uh, by the, the company uh, representative, the main company representative, to, to verify that uh, the information is correct. Your NAICS code goes in there and some other information. Um, this then gets posted, as we'll see later on in the presentation, between the beginning of February and the end of April. But this is the information then that would be posted in a conspicuous place for the workforce to see. So that's your, your summary. What I used to do whenever I had my program, I never posted my masters. I would file those and I would actually only post the, the copy just in case something happened to it, it, it was lost, it disappeared, the way you would have that information. And then each year I, I actually had a folder uh, in case I had a visit from somebody and I would, I would have the information available to me. Okay, so let's look at this rule. As I said, we're gonna we're gonna work this from the uh, the basics all the way up. And um, and well, while we're still talking about the forms, you can download a packet that OSHA has right on our web page. It's under our publication section, and it actually has these three forms as well as some very generic basic. Uh, information on how to complete the form. So if you're looking for some backup on it, on this, uh, that's a good place to go as well. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, organization of the rule. Uh, the main part of the rule is subpart C, and uh, the rule number would be uh, 1904. That's our record keeping standard, and then this would be the different subparts to that. So let's start looking at the whole rule as a whole. Uh, basically, employers that are not exempt are required to record and report work-related fatalities and injuries and illnesses. Um, and one of the things where we run into um, a concern is uh, sometimes folks feel that what they have on their workers' comp has to mirror the OSHA, and that's not, a, not the case at all. The rules between workers' comp and OSHA are entirely different. So what might show up in one form may not show up in the other, or may show up in both. So they're independent of one another. So let's jump into subpart C, the, the workhorse part of the rule. And what we're going to do, we're going to run through this main piece. This, this is where we get most of our questions. Um, is it a new case? Is it uh, work related? Um, and, and you got to kind of work through these. They give us a little decision tree to work from, and this is basically um, at the 10,000 foot level. Uh, did the employer experience an injury and illness? The answer is yes or no. Then you've got to ask yourself, is it work related? From there, is it a new case or not? If it is a new case, then you may need, and you need to record it. If not uh, a new case, then you may need to just continue adding information to your previous case. Uh, maybe it's the number of days lost, the number of days restricted, or whatever. Um, but that's the basic decision tree. It's work related. If something in the work environment actually um, created the problem um, or contributed to it, so maybe maybe there was water on the floor or uh, an unevenness to the floor, um, maybe somebody fell, um, but is there something in the workplace that would have created the issue? Then we go on to the next part, is it something significantly aggravating a pre-existing injury and illness? Um, 
And if so, you know, you're establishing your, your work relatedness. And generally speaking, work relatedness is presumed for injuries and illnesses uh, for events that do occur in the workplace. Um, so what would be the exceptions to this? Say something um, occurs as a, somebody is a member of the general public. Um, and let, let's pick on, say, maybe a grocery store. You have somebody that's uh, an employee. They're working in there all day. Uh, they don't have any injuries. They come back later on in the day or before they go home, and now they're doing some shopping on their own, and somehow they're hurt. They're no longer working. They're no longer on the clock. They're there as a member of the general public, and that would not be included then because they're, they're not an employee at that moment. Uh, the next one there, symptoms arising in the work environment that are solely due to non-work-related event um, or exposure. And they give us a uh, work related only if the work event or exposure is a discernible cause of the injury and illness. Um, so that would be our second piece. Voluntary participation in a wellness program. Maybe you're having some folks come out to do um, uh, to take blood or, or maybe they're doing an exercise program or whatever. That would not be covered as well. That would be a, a wellness program. Eating, drinking, preparing food for, for consumption. That would not be. But then the exception to the exception would be maybe you're having a work function, people have to be there, and somebody um, has to be there, it, it's a required item, then that would not be for um, uh, meeting the, the, the exception. They would be there because they, they had to be there. Some more, uh, performing personal tasks. Um, the example that's given in our Q&A is uh, maybe it's a sewing factory and somebody uh, comes in to use the company's sewing machines. Uh, they, were, they were approved after duty hours, or maybe they're doing some clerical work, or they're using the company's office equipment after hours, maybe to help their, their children or whatever. It has nothing to do with work. That would be one there. Personal grooming, self-medication, oh, that would be an exception. Motor vehicle accident in the parking lot. Um, that would be exempt too, but there's some other caveats to that as well. But generally speaking, that would probably be exempt. But if we had one, contact us. We'll dig into the fine details with you on that one. Common cold, that would be exempt. Uh, mental illness, unless somehow it, it is work-related. There was something that, that would have triggered it, maybe uh, they were working with a chemical, uh, were overexposed, and it was affecting them somehow or whatever. But uh, uh, typically mental illness would not be covered. Travel status. That's while somebody's traveling, and that's the travel portion. But once they have established a home away from home, those items would not be covered. Um, a good example of that, uh, when I had my program, uh, one of my employees was in the shower, fell, hurt themselves. Uh, at that point, the employee had established a home away from home. So that was not uh, an OSHA recordable. Um, workers comp maybe, I'm not sure. I don't remember how that worked out on that end. But on OSHA side, that was not recordable because uh, the employee had established a way, home away from home. Um, detour for personal reasons. Uh, maybe somebody's um, running some errands and they decide that uh, it, it's near lunchtime, so they're going to go run a few on their own. And uh, doing so, they, they, they get hurt somehow, somewhere. Uh, detour. No, that would not be work-related. If, if it was something they were doing on their own, um, it was not work-related. Work at home. Now, OSHA is not coming out to inspect your workplace, but if, if they were doing something at the performance of their day and it became work related, it was work related because of what they were doing, then that would be. Um, so if they trip over the family dog, no, that would not be covered. But maybe if they're uh, setting up their computer uh, and uh, for some reason they drop it on themselves or whatever the case may be and they're hurt, if it's work related, then that would be recordable. Um, new cases. Uh, that's 
if you haven't previously experienced one, that's a new case. Um, and then previously experienced cases would be considered a new case if they had recovered. But if they haven't fully been recovered, if they haven't been re released from, uh, from their medical, then um, that would not be considered a new case. Also, uh, is there a medical opinion? And if a doctor renders an opinion, you need to follow that opinion. So say you have an employee that um, is working, they get hurt, and the doctor prescribes that they be restricted duty or, or off for a number of days, but the employee comes in anyway, you gotta go with the doctor's opinion. So that's, that's what you would use in that particular case. What if you have two doctors and they're conflicting? What do you do now? Well, she says you take the most authoritative um, diagnosis from, from whichever one and you run with that. I didn't say the worst case, I said the most authoritative. You gotta see which doctor um, has more authority in, in, in the particular situation. So you, it's a judgment call on your end at that point where you may have to talk to your panel physician or your own doctor to, to, to work through that. Also, if something in the workplace triggers a reoccurrence, maybe somebody's held up over a particular issue and something triggers it again. I was at a, a site um, uh, and an employee was using um, a product on some tables to clean them, became overexposed, and uh, we ended up calling 911. They went to the hospital. It was uh, um, one of those odd things, but it triggered that reoccurrence for that employee. The signs and symptoms occur even in the absence. Um, and here we're talking about some of the, the, the worst diseases, uh, well, some, some of the diseases like silicosis, asbestosis, tuberculosis, and other items along that line if they come back because these folks will never get better from these. Uh, their, their condition will continue to get worse. So what type of things do we, we uh, look at then? What are the different categories? It's recordable, of course, if somebody dies, they lose days from work, if they've restricted work activity, or they transfer to another position, that would be covered by this. Medical treatment uh, beyond first aid. We're gonna talk about first aid, what first aid is here. If somebody loses consciousness, maybe they, they hit their head or whatever, uh, they lose consciousness, that's recordable. Significant physical illness injury, that also would be. So let's start with the um, with the days away. One or more days away. And of course on the form, the 300 log, you would mark um, that it was a days away. And you do not count the day that it occurred. So uh, say this morning something would have happened to me, uh, they wouldn't count today. The county would, counting would start as of tomorrow. Um, and the type of days we count are actually calendar days. Used to be we counted only work days, now we count calendar days. But when you hit 180, you stop. That, that's where we cap that. And as I mentioned earlier, you gotta follow that, that doctor's um, medical opinion. And in the standard, they call that a physician or licensed healthcare provider. One down from that would be restricted work days. And it's very similar, uh, one or more days, once again, you check the box on your 300 log, and you do not count the day of the injury or illness. And that's for folks that are unable to work the full day he or she would have been scheduled to work or unable to perform routine job functions. Now, sometimes we get um, folks that don't do the same thing. Uh, they have a variety of things they do, and an employer's stuck with trying to figure out, okay, how are they restricted or not? Uh, how do we know? know that. How do we make that determination? And a good way to do that is to look at your previous work week. and You say, well, could have they performed these tasks this week? And if they could have, well, then you may not have a restriction. But if they can't, well, then you would have the restriction. Good way to go back and look at that. Oh, um, and before we get off the counting of the days, um, 
that 180 that we talked about for uh, restricted or days lost, that's the cap between the two. So maybe they had 35 days lost and then they were restricted for, uh, say, 200 more days. So you take the 30, subtract it from the 180, and get 150. You wouldn't put the whole 200 for restricted. The cap is 180 between the two. Restricted work activities. Um, okay, I did good. Okay. Um, it's not recordable. If uh, minor muscular skeletal disorders, I think uh, some days we get up and uh, we have, uh, we, we just don't fill up, up the par. Um, uh, that probably wouldn't be. I mean, if it's minor muscular skeletal discomfort, um, a health care provider determines that the employee is fully able to perform his or her routine job functions. Okay. Doctor says it's okay for them to go back to work. Um, and here's an interesting one. The employer assigns a work restriction to that employee for the purpose of presenting, preventing a more serious condition from, uh, from occurring. So the person doesn't have an issue. Um, they're able to do their full job. They haven't lost any days. There's no restriction. But you say, well, maybe maybe we just need to give them, um, let them take it easy a few days. Now, the last little piece, we talked about days lost, restricted. Now let's talk about job transfer. Because that's part of that, uh, that GHIJ that we saw at the top of the form. And that's when an injured employee is assigned to a job other than their routine job. So you, they, they can't do their job. Say well, let's let's put them over there. Um, that way, we keep them keep them on the rolls, keep them coming back, um, and we're just going to give them something else to do. We we're going to have them come in, and maybe they're going to help with something else. So maybe they work in a in, in a physical environment. They're doing a lot of things. Maybe they can't lift. So you say, hey, we're going to put you over in the office for a few days. We're behind on our paperwork, so you're going to help us out over there. That'd be a job transfer. And the last bullet there, a case is recordable if the injury and illness, I'm sorry, if the injured or ill employee performs his or her routine function duties for part of the day and is assigned to another job for the rest of the day. So that'd be that transfer piece. Medical treatment is to manage care of an injury, but it does not include uh, going in for observation or counseling. Okay, we're gonna we're just gonna observe you for a while. We're gonna do some counseling. Um, that would be that would not be medical treatment. Uh, diagnostic procedures. Okay, we're gonna take an X-ray or whatever. Uh, that wouldn't be. Or first aid. And so OSHA is actually defined first aid, so that we have a clear understanding as to what's covered and what is not. And the first one, using a non-prescription med, a non-prescription strength. Okay. But say you um, uh, are told by the doctor to take several Tylenol, and now you're getting to prescription strength. Okay. Now that would be recordable. Uh, immunization for tetanus. That doesn't mean they just stepped on a nail and um, had an injury there. That's you're, you're being proactive. You're giving out the immunization in the absence of an injury cleaning, flushing, or soaking surface wounds, putting wound covering on. Now, this wound coverings wouldn't be stitches. That's beyond first aid. Uh, stitches aren't on there. It's butterfly bandages, stereo strips. Hot or cold therapy, that would not be. But if the person goes for a physical, to see a physical therapist, now they're receiving more than just uh, hot or cold therapy. Non-rigid means of support. Uh, they put a cast on or something rigid, well, then that would not be first aid. Temporary immobilization devices would not be covered. Drilling a fingernail, toenail to drain uh, the fluid, for, that would be first aid. Wearing an eye patch. Removing a foreign body using irrigation or cotton, cotton swab, that would not be. But say for some reason it was metal and the doctor used a magnet. A magnet's not on the list, so that would be 
not considered first aid. First aid is only the irrigation or cotton swab. Removing splinters or foreign material from areas other than the eye by irrigation, tweezers, cotton swab, or other simple means. That would, that would be first aid. Beyond that, would not be first aid. Finger guards, massages, drinking fluids for the relief of heat stress. That's all first aid. If it goes beyond these, then it would not be first aid and it would be considered medical treatment. And as it says here, if it's not on the list, and that's a comprehensive list, it's not first aid. Now it's medical treatment. Loss of consciousness, that's, that's, that's pretty easy. That would be recordable. And then here's the significant uh, injuries and illnesses. Um, cancer, an irreversible disease, punctured ear bone, uh, drum, a cracked bone or tooth, or fractured. Let's talk about bloodborne pathogens for a moment. Um, they need to be recorded, and you can actually use your OSHA log, but it would actually be a supplemental log because it would be considered a privacy case, um, as your uh, needle stick injury log. Um, that can be done. But what do we have here? Needle sticks and cuts from sharp objects that are contaminated with another person's blood or the other potentially infectious materials. Um, so that's what we're talking about here, as well as splashes. So at this point at the top of the screen, you can see that that's under the record keeping standard. It's 1904.8. And then when we talk about the injury log, the Sharps injury log, we jump over to the bloodborne pathogen standard because we see a 1030 there. And that basically, you, you need to have a log for these, these incidents. And as I said, the OSHA injury and illness log can serve that same purpose, providing it has all of the information that's required on the SHARP log. TB, that's also an area that uh, you would need to put on the log. Somebody has TB. And OSHA has a directive to help guide uh, an employer through the TB. Hearing loss, uh, somebody's doing something that's noisy, they've had a hearing loss, they've had that shift, that also would be covered by that. So let's take a closer look at that, the OSHA log. Um, and chances are uh, you may not be using the first report of injury that OSHA has at 301. I've not seen many employers use it over the years. They'll have something else from maybe their insurance company or whatever. But universally, I've seen everybody use the 300 log. And that's why I wanted to look at that with you for a moment. Um, you might see one line there. You're not limited to one line per entry. If you need more space, you need to put a little more detail, definitely put it in. Um, if, if you have a, a, a building and somebody's hurt somewhere, don't say it was just building five, but say maybe building five, um, maybe the, uh, the lobby area or whatever the room, be a little more specific with, with what, um, what you have there. And we have the employee's name, their title, the date of the injury, when it occurred, and the description. Once again, if you need more room, you need three lines. Put three lines worth in. Uh, if you have it on a spreadsheet, you know you can add add what you need there. But put a description in so that it makes sense. And, and the purpose of the log isn't just to have it fill out another piece of paper. What we want employers to do is to actually go back and look at where they're having accidents and see what they can do to prevent another one from occurring. Um, and this makes a good topic for safety committees. It makes a good topic for maybe you're corporate and you have several locations and, and you see a trend. You know, maybe you're having a trend of a certain type of injury and maybe you need to, to look at that closer. Maybe you need to look at a program. Uh, what I saw whenever I had my employees, I had about 3,500 employees where I was a safety manager. And what I would use it for was to look for those, for those common threads. And generally, if I saw an accident come along, I tried to get ahead of it because it just always seemed, at least to that many employees, if you had one, you get a rash of them. So if you could get ahead of the first one as it came down the pike, 
you could get ahead of the rest of them as well. But if, if you ignored it, uh, the second one was usually worse and, and so forth. So that's the purpose of the log. It's supposed to serve as a tool for you to use to, to look for problems, to look at these as opportunities, to try to fix things before you have a problem. And that's one of the reasons we want the corporate person to actually sign off on that 300 a then the summary at the end of the year so that they're also looking at this saying okay we're losing a lot of money here with with um, we OSHA has a program called safety pays and we can actually put different types of injuries into this this uh, calculator and come up with what it costs and if you know um, some of your financial numbers you can put them into the program and it'll tell you how much work you have to do to actually pay for that that injury whether it was a broken bone or a back injury and when you look at it you sit there and say you know we have a lot of work to do to pay for that one injury so uh, there's a there's a need to take care of injuries and illnesses first because it's the right thing to do two it's an employer's responsibility but three uh, there is a large cost associated with this, and the only way to get ahead of it is to look for where are these losses and what can we do to, to, to curve that and get ahead of it. And that's where this actually serves as one of your most valuable tools that you have. And then springboarding off of this um, as part of your worker safety committee, if you, if you put one together for the state, state they're going to want you to look at this. They're going to want you to look at your work site. So um, this, this is a valuable tool. Then we move into the next columns where we figure out what type of injury, is it a days away, um, lost time, uh, that's what, that would be your days away, restricted or transferred. And if you're on OSHA's website and you see an acronym co called DART, or you're overlooking at what the injury and illness rates are for your industry under the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I should have pulled that down today, that would have been a helpful tool, so you could have compared your numbers with, with what industry is doing as a whole. And what I'll do when I go back, I'll share with PHCA for your three NAICS codes, your TERSER and your DART rate, and you can actually look at this, and I'll, I'll send the formula as well, and you can look at your numbers and see how you compare to others. Are you as uh, profitable on, on the uh, accident side, or are you losing a lot of money there because you're having a lot of accidents? And as I said, that's where this log really comes in. So the, the first word that I use there is DART. That's, that's the ones called days away, restricted, and transferred. And when we look at the log a little bit closer, that would be your columns H, I, and you take the total of those two. So say you had five days away cases and two job transfer cases, um, five and two would be seven. And then what OSHA requires you to do is multiply that times 200,000. Um, and then you would divide by your total man hours worked. And that would be everybody. That would be management, sales, um, everybody in your company would be the man hours. So you take um, the two, the five, add those together, get seven times 200,000. So you get 14,000 and then divide by your man hours. And that would give you your DART rate that you would compare to others. Um, then OSHA has another number. And it's also used by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and that'll be the other number I give you, called the total case incident rate. And there we take columns H, I, and J, all three. That would be your days away, transfer restricted, and other cases, all recordables. And you would add those three numbers. So in our first example would be the two for the days away, five for the transfer, and maybe you had three other. So two, five, and three would be 10 times 200,000, which then gives you 2 million, and you divide by the man hours work, and that would give you your TERSA rate, and you can compare yourself there as well. So I'll share those numbers with you as, as a tool. So basically, when you fill this out, you pick one of these categories, you'd put an X in the box for each one, and then you'd add them up at the bottom. Here would be the number of days that we talked about. Of course, you don't count the, the day it occurred. And then finally, what type of case, the description, and you'd add those up as well. Now, privacy cases, OSHA realizes that you should not put these on the um, log because they are a privacy case. So it says, do not enter the name of the employee on your 300 log for the privacy case. Just enter it as what's called a privacy case. 
and then you'd keep a separate list. So the first one I'd call that privacy case one, two, three, and then you could cross-reference it to your names on your other list so that you'd have them. What type of cases would OSHA look at for privacy cases? That would be anything involving an intimate body part, sexual assault, mental illness, HIV, and then here's our needle sticks. Um, so that'd be a, a privacy case. And then also if an employee requests to have their name, name off the list. And where this comes in is say an employee requested a, a, a copy of the log and you were to give it to them, they wouldn't see the employee's names on it. Now you don't post this, you post the summary which has no names. So a little more, more about privacy protection, um, you know, using discretion and describing the case on you know, the description piece. And um, there's different people that are authorized to see this. One, of course, would be OSHA or the Bureau of Labor Statistics that might come by to ask to see your logs. Um, they would be um, allowed. Um, but then you have others here. If you give the forms to people not authorized by the rule, uh, I went over OSHA, an employee can request it, uh, their, their family member, or if they're rec uh, recognized by a bargaining unit, they, they would be uh, permitted as well. But um, that's who would be authorized. If you give the forms to people not authorized by the rule, you got to remove their names first, such as an auditor, um, workers' compensation or insurance, or public health authority or law enforcement agency. OSHA also requires that the people be aware of, of the need to report injuries and illnesses. Um, if somebody gets hurt, you really need to know about it to make them whole. Uh, you also need to know about it to do something about it to affect correction. So you need to have the employee involvement piece. They need to know how to report an injury and illness, that they know they can do it without any fear of any discrimination, and that needs to be relayed to the employee. Now, this is that access piece, limited access, um, and what, what's the time frames for um, employees, former employees, authorized representatives, um, the OSHA Form 300, that's your log, by the end of the next business day, OSHA Form 301 to an employee, former employee, or a personal representative by the next of the business day. And if it says provide the Form 301 to authorized representative within seven calendar days, provide only the information about the case section form. And if you had that and you need more detail, we could pull up this 1904.35 and run through the whole thing. There's also a discrimination part of the rule, which and that's covered by the OSHA Act. Uh, it's Part 11C of the OSHA Act. And it, it prevents you, prohibits you from discriminating uh, against an employee for reporting an injury and illness. Okay. I know some of that was basic, but uh, it never hurts to, to revisit the, the basic rules. And now I want to move forward to um, what we have more recently. OSHA has uh, rules for the electronic submission of injury and illness records. And um, basically, companies with 20 to 204 employees in certain industries are required to electronically report their, their injuries and illness information to OSHA. How do you know if you're, if you're one of those companies or not? Well, there's an Appendix A to Subpart E. I've taken all three of your NAICS codes and I've looked at the um, appendix, and you are required to do the electronic reporting. So you're required by the NAICS code. So let's go back and look at the beginning of that paragraph. It says establishments with 20 to 249 employees. I didn't say companies. Uh, the record keeping requirements that we talked about earlier talked about the companies. If you have the, the more than 10 employees, you got to do the, the record keeping. What we're talking about here now is the electronic submission of this information, and it's for establishments with 20 to 249 employees. So let's go look 
um, oh, let's finish this paragraph here. Um, what we're looking at here, the record we're looking at, you, you um, electronic reporting is your 300A, that's your summary. Not your first report of injury, not your log, but the summary report. And we're gonna look at some, some dates here, but essentially when a rule first came out, it was at the end of 2017, and for this year, uh, for, for 2017 data, it was the 1st of July of 2018. You had to put in your 2017 data. And then for 2018, that data will go in on the 2nd of March of 2019. So it's phased in over time. Okay, now let's go back to what this establishment versus company looks like. The, the company goes with you if you keep records at all. That was, the ten or, that was more than 10 employees. And then down here, for the electronic piece, we're not looking at the company as a whole. We're looking at each establishment. If you have 20 to 249 in your NAICS code, you would do the electronic reporting. And uh, I've had questions from folks. What is an establishment? So that we're all clear, I threw this in here to help make sure we all get a good feel for this. And if you get stuck in the standard and you don't know where I found this, it's at the very end. It's 1904.46 is where the, the definitions are. There's a few there, and this really helps. An establishment is a single physical location where business is conducted, where services or industrial operations are performed. So it's each, each location. For activities where employees do not work at a single physical location, such as construction, which makes sense, they're moving around, or transportation, communications, electric gas, or sanitary services, or similar operations. The establishment is represented by the main or branch office, terminal, station that either supervise such activities or the base for which personnel carry out these activities. So we need to have a location where each employee um, reports to, and that would be what, where they would be considered at that establishment. You go to add that up. I don't think that this next slide pertains to, to most of you, but it may. Um, the original rule when it came out for companies with more than 215 employees, the way it was originally written was that you had to submit the information on the, the first report of injury, the 301, the 300 log, and the 300A. Um, that's been put in the Federal Register to change that. And at this point, you couldn't if you wanted to because the system will not allow you to. But you do need to put the 300A in. You don't put the 301 or the 300 anymore. You have to just do the 300A. So the larger companies, if they have to keep records, then they would fall under that 300A. They'd have to put that in electronically. So how do you put the information in? Well, OSHA has a, a website for this. And let's just take a look at some dates. Um, as you can see, 2018's date has passed. That was the 1st of July. Um, so that brings us up to how would you submit your 2018 data. And moving forward, every 2nd of March, before that, you got to get this data in. Because what happens on that day, the system shuts down and you cannot put your data in. So if you go in on the, on the if you would have went in on the 2nd of July, you, you've missed it. You can't put it in. And likewise, next year, the 3rd of March, you won't be able to put in 2018 data. That's when it has to be put in. And that way, OSHA can, can work, the, work the data, take a closer look at the data, and that's why they have a cutoff date. Now, this doesn't change OSHA's rules at all. It, um, you still have to keep the data. We're not asking you to keep data you didn't have before. The only change is you need to put it in electronically. It's not the first report of injury. It's not the log. It's just the summary form. So let's let's go into the system. The system is called ITA, the Injury Tracking Application System. And basically, there's three ways to put information into the system. You can manually put in your your summary form. You can, if you have it on a spreadsheet that's in a certain format, and we have. Um, and, and I'm not going to go over that format, but if you're interested in this, I give me a call. We, I can show you the format. It, it's basically a big spreadsheet, but you have to put it all in that format. The, the cells are a certain width and a certain order. 
um, and that's called a CSV file, comma, separated value file. Uh, we would save that spreadsheet as a CSV file, and that's what would be downloaded into the system. The third one is some of these record keeping companies have actually made it easier for people because they actually have what's called an application program interface. They'll actually interface with OSHA system and at the um, end of the year when it's time to put this in, uh, their systems are set up to actually just dump the data directly in for OSHA. So manually with that Excel spreadsheet CSV file or with this uh, application program interface. Now if at any time you get stuck with the system, you would actually go to our help desk and fill out a form. I've only had, out of all the companies I work with, only two who've, who've had issues, and that's because they forgot their passwords and had to go through the help desk. But I'm hearing good things that the system works very easy. It, it's pretty painless. If you haven't done it, let's talk about that. First, you gotta, just like if you're creating a, an online account for something, you have to create an account. You know, company name, your name, password, all those good things. And then it'll let you into the system. And so the first step, as it says there in the little arrows at the top, you create an establishment. And maybe you have 10 different establishments. Your company has 10 establishments. Well, you'd, you'd create 10 different, different ones there. Then you'd add your 300A summary data. Then you'd click the button, submit the data, and you'd re receive a confirmation. So let's take a look at some of these screens. Here's your create an establishment. It's pretty straightforward. Here's your 300A form. If you notice, the columns are all marked once again, G-H-I-J. So finish your 300A, get that ready to post, put it in this system, and this follows right off that form. If you have your form done, it follows right off the form. And then you would um, submit your data and it actually will show you your progress as you go through. It marks as you get different pieces done. Now, if you have multiple establishments, they all show up in the system. And, um, and as I mentioned, we had the um, um, uploading of the batch files. That would be your, your CSV files. And, and we have instructions on that as well, as well as the application program interface. Now, once you've done it correctly, you'll get an email saying it was successful. Uh, if I was still in the field doing your work, I would print that out and put it in my file with my 300A at the end of the year, or I would save that email just to prove that you've done it and it was good. If it's not successful, the system will let you know that as well. Um, and if you have problems, that goes back to the help desk. So. So that was the electronic piece, um, a good piece of it. And um, the annual summary, you'll set down the 1st of February to the end of April. You'll complete that, it gets signed, you post it. That's the time to actually put in the electronic form as well. The deadlines, as I had mentioned, and I'm going over this a couple times because I don't want you to miss it. Uh, the next one that's coming up for 2018 data is March 2nd of 2019. Now, what happens if you try to go in past that date? You actually get uh, an announcement, and it basically says the system is not accepting data at this time. You, you missed the date. So what happens now? Well, OSHA originally put out some guidance back at the beginning of this year, uh, giving OSHA guidance on how to handle these cases when people didn't put in the data. So maybe uh, a site establishment receives an OSHA inspection. The question comes up to you electronically submit. And if it turns out that you didn't, um, what happens then? So OSHA put some initial guidance out. I have not received any newer guidance. So this is what it said. You attempted, now this would have been for your 2016 data that would have went in in July of 20, um, 
at the end of 20, um, I got my dates mixed up. Here we go. Um, that would have went in on the 31st of 2017. Likewise, if you'd have missed the date in July 1st of 2018 for your 2017 records, um, you need to provide some proof that you tried to get into the system, that it, it, it would not allow you to show that you did make a good faith effort to try to put it in, but you missed the deadline. They go on from there, and if you can show that you put in your following year's data, so say you didn't get your 2016 in, but you got your 2017 in in a timely manner, and you can show that you did put try uh, in 2016, uh, with your 2016 data, uh, but the 2017 rolls around and you did get it done properly, what happens then? Well, OSHA would only give you what's called an other than serious citation um, with an appropriate penalty um, if you don't produce the records. But if you did produce the records, you get an other than serious with no penalty. What they're trying to do is get people to start using the system. And a lot of folks are using it. I've done a lot of presentations to try to step people along to get it right. I've had many people in the audience uh, share with others that they've tried and it worked well. It, it, it is painless. Um, but you do want to do it. You don't want to get in trouble for not doing that. Posting. Um, that summary report, the 300A, goes in a conspicuous place. I never put my originals out. I always put a copy. And that has to go in between the 1st of February and the end of April of each year. I've had questions. Do we have to maintain this? Yes, you got to keep these records for five years. Don't want to get rid of them. Do I have to update them? The only one you have to keep updated is the 300 log. So as things change, you got to keep the 300 log correct. If, there, if somebody lost more days or restricted days, you'd go put that in. Um, but you would actually keep that up to date. It's only the 300 log. You don't have to keep the, the uh, first report of injury or your summary up to date, just the 300 log. I've had folks tell me, oh, we file those and put them in the Connex out back in a box. Now you still have to have access to that 300 log to keep it up to date. Reporting. Now up to this point, we've only talked about recording or electronic recording. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about reporting. Reporting would be to OSHA. This would be the employer's responsibility to report to OSHA. If you've had a fatality, you need to let us know within eight hours. If you've had an inpatient hospitalization, and that's determined by the hospital, not yourself, a loss of an eye or an amputation, and an amputation is with or without bone loss, that has to be reported to OSHA within 24 hours. So if it occurs on a Friday night or a Saturday and you don't come in until Monday, You've gone past the 24 hours. So you need to look at having procedures for how do you handle those off-shift hours? Or what if you're out of country? Who's going to cover that for you? Um, and the reason you want to make sure you get it right, you don't want to get a citation for not notifying us. So you have to let us know. Three options to let us know. You can do it by phone to your local OSHA office, to our 800 number, or electronically on our web page. And what type of information will they ask for? Just about everything you're probably keeping track of already. Uh, already. Uh, establishment name, the location, the date and time. Um, was it a reportable event? You know, all, all those good things. You need to share that. Number of employees, the name of the employees, um, temporary workers. Uh, if it was a temporary worker, who was the agency? If it was a union employee, uh, your contact number. If, if they need to follow back up, and then a description. So I've had companies say to me already, well, I don't have all the information. I don't want to place that call. Place the call. Stop the clock. Because the 24-hour clock is something you don't want to get in trouble for. So make sure you make that call. Stop 
the clock. You can call back then with more information, or if you find out, well, no, they only went in for observation. If they went in for observation, you didn't have to let us know, but we can back that back out. So if you have one of these, uh, make sure you stop the clock. And the big thing they're going to want to know is what are you going to do to prevent somebody else from getting hurt? Was it a cut? Was it a fall? What was it? What are you doing to prevent somebody else from getting hurt? That's, that's going to be one of the big concerns that they have. So what happens then, you can either, OSHA will elect to come out and perform an inspection, or they will do this thing called a rapid response investigation, or an RRI, and they'll let you do that. And I will tell you from the records, most of them, uh, we let you do the RRIs. Uh, hospitalizations, um, quite a few, um, percentage-wise, you would get to do of those. Um, as far as the amputations, which it does go out on more of those. Um, last year, I think we went out on, it was between 30 and 40% of the amputations, um, but not all of them. Uh, the majority were handled by you as this RRI process. And basically, it's an internal investigation you have five days to go through to tell us what you found, answering pretty much those questions that I gave you earlier, maybe a few more. Provide abatement verification, what you did to prote uh, protect somebody else from getting hurt. And sometimes we have people say, hey, we found this was broken or whatever, and it's going to take a week or two to fix. Well, keep us in the loop. Okay, uh, you got back to us. You had a plan. Uh, it, it's going to be fixed in a week or two. Keep us in the loop so that we're not on the outside. If OSHA's on the outside, you may then get a visit. So um, keep OSHA in the loop. Um, it says here, provide a copy of the RRI letter and abatement verification to your employee representatives, your safety and health committee. Uh, as long as it gets to the employees, that's what we want to see. Post a copy of that letter for employees review and then return a signed copy of the posting Certifica certifying that you actually posted it back to OSHA. And as it said here, if you need additional time for abatement, you know, uh, talk to OSHA. Start that conversation until it's taken care of because um, it's not always going to be one of those things you can fix in five days. It might take a little longer. So have that conversation. Temporary workers. Um, and this is in the record keeping standard as well. But basically, um, as it says there, you must also record the recordable injuries and illnesses that occur to your employees who are not on your payroll if you supervise these people on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you're supervising them, they're considered yours, and, and you need to uh, record that. Likewise, if, if and I should hope this never happens, um, if you had a um, fatality, you would need to report that as well. And that's an eight-hour time frame. So the next question that people usually ask me is, what does this cost if I don't pick up the phone? And this is where it starts out at. Um, and I will say the company in 2016 that did not call us, uh, the first one we had in the Harrisburg office, um, they received the citation for not notifying us. It was an accident that occurred over a weekend. Um, safety manager came in on a Monday morning hadn't been notified, uh, notified us, and he received the, the first citation. Uh, unfortunately, um, this year they received, they were the first one to receive their second, so it's a repeat, and the repeat came in over $20,000. So that's a lot of money for not making a phone call notification. So I would have a procedure in place uh, and go over it with, with uh, management or, or whomever just to make sure everybody understands what the rules are. And each of these programs are different. Um, we talked about the number of employees that's needed before you actually have to do your recording if you're in certain NAICS codes. You know, that's, that's more than 10. For this reporting piece, reporting to OSHA, th there, there is no minimum. It's not, it's not to 10. It's, it's if you have one employee, um, you have to let us know if there was a fatality, inpatient hospitalization, amputation, or loss of an eye. There is no minimum for that. 
and do you have procedures in place? Okay, you call the local OSHA office, you have a question on record keeping, you're stuck, you have a tough one. Um, this is where they go. Uh, we used to have what's called an OSHA record keeping handbook, and now we actually have this Q&A search. It works pretty good. This is where they'll go to help you with your answer. But the reason I'm going over this, this is a tool you can use as well. And basically, if you put in a number of uh, qualifiers, it'll come back with some responses, a number of, um, of um, possible answers, and just go down through the different ones to see which one matches your situation. So that's a Q&A search on OSHA's webpage to help you through that. So let's move away from the record keeping and see what OSHA is looking at right now. And OSHA puts these programs, they're called emphasis programs, national emphasis programs. And if you notice, there's none here for your NAICS code for, for your type of business. So they're not, um, this year we're not actively looking at, um, at your, your particular industry. We're looking at some of these others. Um, now, I guess I should preface that because we have hazardous machinery. So say you have something that cuts slices or shears or whatever, um, companies do come up on that particular list and that's what they would look at. That would be a, a specific inspection. It wouldn't be a, a full inspection. It would just be for those particular items. And then we look at locally. Now that was nationally. Locally, I look at the local emphasis programs that OSHA has and I don't see you there either. Um, the other is the national list, then there's the local list. Protecting temporary workers. A lot of folks are using temporary workers today, and the number's going up. Companies use them for a number of reasons, and it, it's all good. But what happens sometimes, um, temp workers are concerned because they realize they're a temp worker, they're not a full-time worker, and they don't want to lose... Um, lose their job because they had an inj injury and illness and they're not always, uh, they don't always report them. So they need to be encouraged to do that as well. Um, and, and sometimes uh, maybe a company feels it's the temp agency's duty to do different things. It's not, it's not their responsibility, but the temp agency, but everybody has a hand in this um, as far as the employee. So who's responsible for the temp worker? Well, it's actually both. Everybody has a hand in this. Uh, the temp agency, a lot of times, they may not even know what activity is going on. They may not have come by the site, and they need to do that. They need to see what their folks are doing, uh, what, what maybe protective equipment they need, what training they need. Um, and they may only be able to give generic Let's say it's hazard communication on chemicals and, and they're using some cleaner. They may give generic training back at the, uh, back at the uh, agency when the folks come in. Uh, maybe they didn't. Um, and that, that's why it's good to have that conversation with them, to find out who's doing what before the employee rules on site. But as far as hazard communication goes, using that as an example, um, maybe they're giving a generic class. The specific chemicals you're using, maybe they don't know what you're using. And so that would be your job for that one. So both sides have a piece in this. And until you sit down and work out the details as to who's responsible for what, um, you know, it's definitely a joint responsibility. Because you both share the employee. So just some things to think about. I know she's prepared a number of fact sheets to help you, but just some things to think about. Uh, the training, you know, what training are they getting? Are they getting orientation training from the temp agency? Maybe they're not. Maybe the temp agency, and, and this is what I've seen in some of the cases I've been involved with, is the temp agency says, well, it's the host's responsibility. And the host is like, no, we hired the employee. It's a temp agency. You've got to have that conversation. Who's responsible for what and in what ang language? Emergency action plan. They show up. Do they even know what to do in the event of an emergency? Um, and going back to training, maybe it's even somebody doing housekeeping. Do they know the basics? You don't pour ammonia in with bleach, right? Um, just things like that. It can affect the others in your workplace. What type of training do they have? There's your HASCOM piece, maybe chemical monitoring, 
maybe they're doing something where they're, they need a medical evaluation. Uh, what about protective clothing and equipment? You know, who's figuring out what they need? Who's providing it? Maybe nobody's providing it. This is, this is what needs looked at. Who's giving the first aid treatment? What's the rules there? This all needs worked out ahead of time. Who's maintaining their exposure and medical records? Things to think about. Um, more questions. Who's more familiar with, with the workplace and knows the hazard for their own employees? Um, I, I deal with a lot of companies under our, what's called a VPP program, Voluntary Protection Program. A lot of them just take the temp worker, they put them under their, the, uh, the rules and the training as, as their full-time employees, and eventually, sometimes if they really feel they have a good temp worker, they'll bring them on board, and if they're already trained and they have all their equipment, they don't have to do anything else. I know some companies, they bring everybody in through the temp agency, um, but it's, it's what works best for you, but somebody has to figure this all out. And as it says here, if same hazards, doing the same type of work, if, if you're familiar with what the folks are doing and you're giving them training, um, maybe maybe make the uh, temp worker successful and, and, and just take that on or put it back on the temp agency. Who controls the workplace hazards? Uh, the temp agency can't fix something. Um, so who's responsible for that training? Who supervises that temp worker? That's what OSHA would look at if they came in. Some more thoughts. Um, if you're the temp agency, and some are doing this. I go out and I deal with different different temp agencies. Um, they'll actually come out, look at what the hazards are, try to figure out what programs are needed, temporarily revisit the work area, looking at these hazards, see what's needed. Um, if the host doesn't do their part, temp agency is going to have to pick it up. I mean, it's just, but that they need to know who's doing what. They also need to come out and touch base with the temp worker to see how things are going, see if there's any, any holes in their safety program, training employees, report worksite hazards, a lot, of, a lot of responsibilities for the temp agencies. Um, the host, pre-planning. Uh, coming up with who's responsible for what in that agreement, spelling out who's responsible for what, PPE, figuring out the hazards, how are they being controlled. And we've actually had several fatalities and bad accidents involving temp workers that didn't have the right equipment, that didn't have the right training, that didn't know the procedures, that got in trouble with lockout, tagout. Uh, we have one on our webpage. It was his first day at work. He was very proud. He, uh, the fact he uh, had secured employment. He was standing in the restroom and he took a, photo, a selfie of himself. Um, and then later on that day, he was caught up in a uh, in a machine. Didn't go home. So we're just trying to get ahead of this. Just trying to get everybody to touch base with one another. Clear division of responsibilities. Pre planning. Communication. So as I said, OSHA's put out a lot of different guidance documents to help with this, everything from using a powered industrial truck to hazard communication to help. We've even put together our web page, and we have an alliance with the ASA, the American Staffing Association in D.C. We're trying to get ahead of this. What else do we have? This has been a horrendous year for rain, and these days we've had lately uh, have been very hot. So if you have folks working outside, make sure you're providing water, rest, and shade, and making sure that they're climatized um, for, their, for their benefit. Employee incentive programs, OSHA's come out with some guidance here. And um, we've actually had, had um, problems where employees haven't always reported injuries and illnesses because they don't want to affect other people getting an incentive out of their, their employer and so they, they don't report it. And that's been a concern to us because if, if, if an incident's not reported, a hazard's not corrected, and somebody else can get hurt, nothing's been gained, and it's, it's not a win-win. It's actually a lose then, even for you, if they don't report these. Um, and the second may be worse than the first. So we've put out guidance. Uh, originally, the guidance came out in 2011. Uh, actually, it came out before then speeches, 
and then that was for VPP sites and then for companies as a whole in, in 2012. And as I said, a problem isn't fixed because it's concealed. Um, incidents aren't investigated, root causes aren't found, employees don't get what they need in the end. They're not made whole. So we found there's four types of programs. Uh, first is taking discipline against an employee who's injured on a job regardless of the circumstances. And I do understand that uh, if somebody doesn't follow a work rule, um, you, know, you, you may need to discipline them. That's just part of how it works. Or maybe they hurt somebody else. So, But the thing is we want to make sure that the work rules are applied uniformly. Not just to people who've had an accident, but for everybody across the board. If you don't follow the work rule, it, it doesn't matter if you had the accident or not. You, you should be held accountable. Um, and that's that's the first category here, taking action without looking at the circumstances. And, and maybe it was one of those things where it's muscular skeletal. Somebody's done something for a number of years, um, and it was a repetitive injury, and, and they, they were hurt. Um, is it appropriate to, to uh, discipline for, for something like that? That's, that's the question we're raising. We're disciplining for somebody uh, for the manner and time of reporting. Maybe, maybe the reporting system is, is very cumbersome and it's hard for somebody to, to report an injury and illness. So um, I was just concerned about that. Is it, is it something people can report easily? Do you have a work rule? Has it been communicated on how to report these? Violation of a safety rule, and I talked about that earlier. That um, if you violate a rule, it shouldn't it shouldn't matter if they had the accident or not. Um, the discipline should be for everybody, not just if you had the accident. It should be across the board. And then um, programs that that have uh, a, a large carrot at the end, you know, um, a drawing. If somebody has an accident, oops, there's no drawing this year, or a large pizza party. It's it's re it's not reporting for the getting people to report for the right reason. It's it's discouraging them from reporting. So what we want to see is not incentive programs that reward for for not having an accident, but it would be good if you had incentive programs that reward people for doing good things with their program, for reporting those safety hazards, or maybe helping you with a certain element of your safety program. Maybe they're helping do the, the safety meeting or maybe conducting training with you. Uh, maybe it's a, a senior employee that has a lot of experience and, and they uh, they help you in a lot of ways, you know, rewarding them for doing these these positive things, not, um, not for not having an accident. How about this one here, reporting a near miss. Hey, I had a close call. Somebody else could have been hurt there. Oh, that's that's a good one. You know, reporting this stuff, um, being involved, being involved in the safety program. Here's a couple things that I've seen: providing T-shirts to people who serve on some of your safety committees. You know, hey, it, it's a good thing. We're rewarding you for trying to do the best that you can. Offering rewards for strengthening uh, ideas, ideas for strengthening your safety program. Uh, how about a recognition party for um, completing? Your safety training, everybody completed it for the year. Hey, that's a good thing. Identifying hazards, helping out with investigations, um, all these good things. You know, what have you seen? What are you doing there? It's all good. What type of things are OSHA finding, is OSHA finding across the board? Um, fall hazards, that's a biggie. Hazard communication problems. Yes, the rule came out in 1983, 84, and 85, and it's still the second most cited OSHA standard. So do you have any uh, issues with your hazard communication program? Do you have your SDS? Do you have a list of your chemicals? Have you given training to people? Do you have a written program? And if you need details on that, you know, we can send you what you need. Scaffolding, respiratory protection, lockout, tagout if they're working on equipment, people getting hurt on ladders or powered industrial trucks. Maybe you have a kitchen area and you're using a uh, a couple tools there. Maybe it's a, a, a blender or a meat slicer. Is it guarded properly? Training. Somebody has to go change the filters on the roof of the building or electrical problems throughout. Now, I took your, your largest NAICS code, the 623312 for assisted living facilities, and I put in for um, October 16th through the 17th, 2017, 
what type of citations OSHA has been finding. And bloodborne pathogens is definitely the, the top item that OSHA has found in your industry, followed by, just like the other list, hazard communication, uh, followed by the record keeping forms. You got to do those forms that we talked about. General requirements for walking surfaces. You know, are they clear? Are they dry? Um, are you maintaining them? All of those good rules. Uh, design requirements for exit re exits. You know, do you have a suitable number of exits out of your facility? Are they suitable? Can people get in and out easily? Are they marked? Um, general requirements for protective equipment. Um, have you done a survey to see what PPE you might need for people to do different jobs for uh, personal protective equipment? Hand protection then was the, was the next one. Wiring, uh, you have electrical wires hanging out of the walls or missing round prongs or, or using uh, temporary uh, cords as permanent wiring. Do you have face protection for, for um, items where people could be exposed to uh, flying objects, whether it be uh, um, maybe cutting wood or uh, bloodborne pathogens or whatever. Medical services and first aid, is somebody trained? General requirements for machine guarding. Is woodworking machinery actually popped up. Um, you know, are the guards in place? We can help get you going in the right direction there. So this is what citations are coming in at these days. They're not cheap. A serious, which is about 71% of OSHA citations, started at 12.9 number. Now they're adjusted for a company's size, their history with this, that goes back five years. Uh, they're also adjusted for good faith. Do you have programs in place? Um, but if you have a willful, we know you have a hazard or it's a repeat, you know, it goes up by a factor of 10. So we look at that. OSHA's put out a new rule for walking and working surfaces. So if you have people walking and working in different areas, um, are they, they designed properly? If they're not designed properly, uh, that can be bad. We just changed that rule. Maybe you're having a new facility build or something modified. We can send you to the right direction for what the current rules are so that the steps are proper, the widths are proper, that um, your walking and working surfaces comply. And I've been dealing with a lot of engineering firms, helping them out, architectural groups, to try to get them up to speed on these rules. But if you're doing some of that work um, and you're not sure, we can point you in the right direction. Each year we put out a calendar of events as to what's hot. Uh, National Safety Month, of course, is in June. We have the Safe and Sound Week where we're trying to get folks to improve their safety program. This year was in August. I don't have the schedule for next year yet, but uh, once I do, we'll be sending that out. And I just want to hit a couple resources with you before we call it a day. So it's just going to take me a moment to hit these. But we do have our OSHA webpage to help you. We'll send you this newsletter on a bi-weekly basis that goes over what's the news with OSHA. We have a staff duty officer. That's a compliance officer that's out of the field for the day, does not have caller ID, and his job is to answer your questions for you. So you call in with a question on one of these standards, that's their job. I'm out on the road a lot. They're in the office, but they're paid to answer your questions, so they're there. We also have a group called Consultation that will come out and do an on-site and look at your programs to help you. And then, of course, myself, I do a lot of presentations. If I have multiple employers, I can actually go out and talk about different topics, and that's what I'm there for. So here's what our quick takes look like. And a new thing that just came out this week, I haven't wrapped my arms around it yet, OSHA put out an employer page and this gets not into OSHA, but also all of the Department of Labor organizations to help you understand pay benefits, small business requirements, all these areas um, within the Department of Labor uh, to make it one-stop shopping, easy for you to get answers as an employer. They also built a sister page up for the employees that does the very same thing. Uh, I mentioned consultation. This is a free service. OSHA picks up the bill. Uh, they don't report to OSHA. OSHA gives each state money to do this, and they, in turn, help you. If you have less than 250 people on a site and 500 in a company, you qualify. They'll look at as little or as much as your program as you wish, um, and they're there to help you be successful. You do not get citations on what they point out, but they do ask you that you fix the items it's funded by OSHA, and it's meant for you. 
Uh, and here's the size of the companies that we, we've worked with within that program. Um, you can see down to one employee or up to 250. So trying to help you, the little guys. What areas? Manufacturing, agriculture, retail, services. And then there's construction there too. So we're trying to help all of you out with this. Um, and the majority, as you can see, were safety issues as opposed to health related issues. And here is their phone number. Um, and then locally in Pennsylvania, the group that handles this and has had this program for 35 years is Indiana University. This is not college students, but this is folks that just do this for a living. They've been around for 35 years. And what I tell people, if you're not too sure how this works, have them come out and look at something small, get a feel for how it goes, uh, get, get to know your local person. If you like the way it goes, and I'm sure you will, uh, then you can have them back again. But, but you know, you can start small with this. You don't have to go big. And we have this throughout the whole country. Uh, we also have training classes, our 10 and 30 hour, and we have a piece on our webpage where you can go to, to get information on our trainers. And earlier I mentioned call your local OSHA office if you have a, um, an injury to re, re, um, report to OSHA. Here's our local numbers, Harrisburg, 717-782. 3902, and then the phone numbers for the other area offices as well. And what I'll do is I'll leave this presentation with, with um, the folks here at PC. Um, with PHCA, and they can share this with you. Um, and of course, as usual, I'm always available to answer questions for you as well. So thank you. Thanks, Dale. That was a lot of information today. Uh, at this time, we're going to open up the question and answer. Uh, we'll try to keep it brief. We've already gone over our time today. So if you do have any questions, go ahead and type those in. We'll give it a moment. Uh, and again, uh, we'll be getting the survey out to you. Please, uh, please make sure that you complete that survey. It's helpful to us and the speaker. And also, the presentation will be made available on our website uh, for viewing for and if you know anyone who can could benefit from it um, let them know that it is uh, the recording will be on our website I'm uh, not seeing any questions I will be sending follow-up emails likely tomorrow um, again I'll include Dale's contact information so if you do have questions you can uh, reach out to him directly um, again I think there was a lot of information he covered uh, covered it really well um, I want to thank Dale for his time today and uh, we'll have another uh, we'll have other webinars. Uh, keep an eye out for postings on webinars coming up later this month and into the rest of the fall. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.